And again, that's John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, today's message is uh, part three in our mini-series that's kind of been riffing off of some Star Wars themes, uh, shamelessly, I might add. <laughs> and today's uh, final sermon in our little mini-series is called The Force Awakens. And that, as the, the intro crawl mentioned, is the title of the latest Star Wars movie. Um, and uh, so th this idea of the force, the force awakens. You know, what is the force in the Star Wars movies? Um, so, you know, for those who aren't familiar with um, the Star Wars movies or you need a little refresher, uh, in the very first Star Wars that was made in 1977, um, there, there was a, a, a classic character, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who was the, the kind of Star Wars, the, 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 the Jedi guru who teaches young Luke. And he tells him what the Force is. And so here's a picture of uh, uh, Alec Guinness, who was a great Shakespearean actor who played Obi-Wan Kenobi in the original movies. And he talks about the Force being an energy field, which is, uh, is given off by every living being. And this energy force surrounds everything in, in the world. And it, it, it also penetrates everything. And it binds the whole universe together. And so uh, in the movies, uh, we find out that Obi-Wan Kenobi can do really cool things with the Force, right? So um, he can do this thing where he waves his hand, and by the power of suggestion, he can get people to do what he wants. So he can be like, nothing to see here. And, you know, people will be like, there's nothing to see here. They'd be like, hey, give me a million dollars. And then you'd be like, oh, hey, here's a million dollars, right? It's pretty cool. Um, I had a friend who uh, is super into Star Wars. And he would try to use his Jedi mind powers on people all the time. He'd be like, you know, the traffic will part for me. You know, <laughs> you will get out of my way. And surprisingly, it never worked. Um, but this idea of the force um, is this great power that can be used in a lot of ways. And it, it can uh, move objects. You can, you know, uh, you could just kind of go to something, you know, I could go to this pew and just, you know, use my Jedi powers and it could lift the, the bench or whatever. So in the movies, who gets to use the force? Jedi, okay? So there's special people. Yeah, so someone was like Jedi and Sith, right? So there's special people who exist in the Star Wars universe who are adept at the force. They are force sensitive, right? Only special people. Everyone has the force around them, but not everyone can use it, right? And so it's this special power that only certain individuals get to use. Now, there are some very uh, uh, easy comparisons that we can make between the force and the Holy Spirit, right? And uh, so I, I was talking to someone this past week, and they asked me what the sermon title was, and so I was like, oh, it's called The Force Awakens. And they're like, oh, is it about the Holy Spirit? I was like, maybe. Um, they, they were right. Yeah, it's, it's about the Holy Spirit, you know? And I think that for a lot of us, we have a really hard time understanding the Holy Spirit. It, it's probably the most difficult thing for us to, to understand um, in Christian theology, you know, because in, in a lot of ways, um, there's no real parallel to it in the real world. You know, because it, for, um, you know, God the Father, obviously we have human fathers, right? We have kings. We have, you know, people that we can make a parallel to for God the Father. For Jesus the Son, again, there's very easy parallels to make. But the Holy Spirit, what do you make of the Holy Spirit? 
And sometimes the Holy Spirit appears as a bird. You know, sometimes it appears as tongues of fire. You know, it's, it's very mysterious. And so, you know, maybe there's some sort of Christian traditions that kind of t- steer away from talking about the Holy Spirit. There, there's actually some churches that believe that the Holy Spirit actually doesn't really, isn't really active anymore. That age has come and gone, right? There's no more miracles. There's no more sort of uh, dispensation of the Holy Spirit, as some denominations would say. So what do we make of this Holy Spirit? I don't think it's something we can just dismiss just because we're uncomfortable with it. You know, because it's something that Jesus tells us is immensely helpful, right? But I do want to say one thing uh, before we dive into the scripture that is very different um, from the idea of the force when it comes to the Holy Spirit. So number one, the, the force is, can only be used by special people. And maybe some of us think that of the Holy Spirit. You know, like, oh, there's like really spiritual people, like my pastor, maybe not this pastor, but you know, there's pastors out there, like super spiritual, you know, and they can like use the Holy Spirit, like, woo, you know, like in some special way, right? There's some really special individuals who are Holy Spirit sensitive. And then the rest of us are just out of luck. We're just normal people. We just have to struggle by without the Holy Spirit. And that is absolutely not biblical. That's not what the Bible says. What, what the Bible tells us is that, uh, you know, after Jesus goes into heaven, he's going to unleash the Holy Spirit for all of us, for all Christ followers. The Holy Spirit is not meant for selective people. It's true that some people will get different gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's a different variety of the way that the Holy Spirit is available to us, but everyone has access to it. And so, you know, maybe some of us may be wondering, well, Pastor Steve, why don't I experience more of the Holy Spirit? Or how do I? You know, what what way can I really see the Holy Spirit take form? And and that's really what today's message is about, is for us to get a greater understanding of the everyday presence of the Holy Spirit for us. What is it? What is it about? And how is it different than a force? You know, because it's not a force. It's so much more. And Jesus is going to tell us about that. So last week, we were uh, studying uh, John chapter 14. And we're going to continue in John chapter 14. Um, And so this is the passage we just read. Uh, So in verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands. We're going to come back to this idea. But there's something very important here that Jesus keeps repeating. Right? Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, that, that's a big deal, right? Uh, through the Word of God, who is Jesus, He is the incarnate Word of God. He's the in flesh Word of God. With a single word, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, more than a single word, but you, you get what I mean, right? That with words, God could create the heavens and, and, and the earth. So, If Jesus, the Son of God, repeats himself, he repeatedly just keeps hammering home the same themes, then I think there's something in there that we really have to pay attention to. And so this is one of those things that he keeps hammering on. He keeps repeating. If you love me, keep my commands. Uh, So we we, got to tuck that away and remember that. If we love him, we must keep his commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So first of all, friends, again, we see a a, a big difference between the Holy Spirit and the force because we are told that the Holy Spirit is an advocate, a helper, um, who is going to help us with something very specific, right? And so it tells us that, yes, there is something mysterious about the Holy Spirit, because the world does not know him. The the world does not know him, or uh, it, 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 it cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And so the Holy Spirit is 
called an advocate. So the Holy Spirit is not a force. The Holy Spirit is a persona, right? And this is why, you know, you hear sometimes when people talk about the, tr the, the Trinity, they say uh, the Holy Spirit is, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, that the Trinity is three persons in one. Um, when I was trying to say the word Trinity, it almost came out as trilogy. Because I think my mind is still on Star Wars, right? It's like, yeah, they have these Star Wars trilogies. But yeah, it's not a trilogy, it's a trinity, right? There are three persons in one. And so you know, the Holy Spirit as a person um, is very important uh, for perhaps one simple fact, that the Holy Spirit uh, being a person means that for us to have the Holy Spirit in us means to have a relationship with God, with the Holy Spirit. Right? This is different than a force. You know, uh, again, I want to show you in um, verses 24 through 26, uh, skipping down a little bit, um, Jesus is going to repeat this idea of the Holy Spirit as an advocate. And so you're going to see here a little more of what the Holy Spirit does. He says, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Remember, we said we're going to get back to this, um, but that Jesus would repeat himself. So this, he's saying the inverse of what he said before. If you love me, you will obey my commands, right? That's the way we start in verse 15. And again, verse 24, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So friends, um, if the Holy Spirit were a force and not a person, then the Holy Spirit could be used like a force. And to go back to Star Wars for a moment, the force is not good or evil, right? In, in Star Wars, you can use the force however the heck you want, right? If I want to use that power or ability to manipulate people, right, to get out of parking tickets, you know, that'd be very useful. Like, I was not speeding, officer, and the officer would be like, I, you weren't speeding, Go on your way, you know, and you're like, thank you, thank you, you know? <laughs> That'd be a really cool power, right? What, isn't there so many cool things that you could do with the force? Don't you wish you could just kind of like control people's minds or move objects with your mind? That'd be so cool, right? And that the, the Bible is very uh, uh, specific to tell us that the Holy Spirit cannot be manipulated like a force. You can't use it for whatever means you want. In fact, there's a character in the Bible who tries to do this. In the book of Acts, um, there's this person that they, the disciples come across named Simon the Sorcerer. And so he knows some sort of magic, right? And people even have a nickname for Simon the Sorcerer. They call him the Great Power, right? Because he seems to have some kind of power within him uh, to be able to do things that people can't explain. So Simon the sorcerer one day meets the disciples and he sees them laying hands on people and giving them the Holy Spirit. And Simon the sorcerer is like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. So he goes to the disciples and he says, hey, how much money will it take for you to teach me how to do that trick? I want to be able to lay hands on people and give them the Holy Spirit too, right? So name your price, you know, uh, $100, $200, $500? And the disciples are like, what are you talking about? This is not a power that you can buy. Like they warn him very sternly. Like, they're like, man, you got to repent for this. This is not how it works, right? So what Simon does not understand is that the Holy Spirit is not some impersonal force or power that you can just manipulate. It's not a magic spell, right? That you just say the right words or go through the right motions. And then all of a sudden things appear. This is one of the things that um, is sort of frustrating for us sometimes. You know, the Holy Spirit is not a genie. You know, so when we pray for things or when we want certain things to happen, we want it to kind of work like magic, like some kind of force. Like, God, you will give me straight A's on that, you know, on my report card. God, you will, gi you will give me that, that job that I want. God, I will marry that person that, I'm in love with or infatuated with, right? We, we want to be able to control God and to control this power, but if the Holy Spirit is a person and not a power, 
then it exists in relationship. It is not to be manipulated. So in other words, maybe you're going like this. You're like, Holy Spirit, give me what I want. And then the Holy Spirit is doing what? It's saying, no, right? Because it's a person. It's a personality. And so this is very important, friends. We must understand the character of the Holy Spirit in order for us, for us to understand how it works in us. And so, friends, how does God exist with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. What do you see in the relationship between God and Jesus? Let's just take God and Jesus, because that's the easiest one, right? God is, is what in the Trinity? Father, right? And then Jesus is who? Son. It doesn't say Jesus is slave. Jesus is servant. Jesus is subordinate. Jesus is worker. It says Jesus is son. What is the fundamental relationship between the father and the son? It's one of beloved father and loving son, beloved son, right? They exist in love for each other. So Jesus has all these things where he talks about doing the father's will. If we don't understand the essential relationship that exists within God, you are going to misunderstand all the times when it talks about command. Friends, remember when I kept pointing out this idea that if you love me, you will obey my commands. Now, friends, I want to ask you to do sort of a thought experiment or to kind of examine your own heart. And I want to tell you where I come out on this, just so, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad here. But when you heard if you obey my commands, or sorry, if you love me, you will obey my commands. What part of that do you focus on? Do you focus on the love or the commands? For me, when I hear that, most of the time, I focus on the commands. When I hear that statement, I'm like, oh, right? It sounds oppressive. If you love me, you will obey my commands. You know, that's the, the way that I hear it in my heart. You know, the emphasis is on what I must do. Duty. I got to do this for God. Oh, I guess I got to do these things for God because he's God. If I really loved him, then I would do this. But friends, I don't think that's what Jesus focuses on. I think what he focuses on is the love. If you truly love me and you have my love in you, then you would obey my commands. As what? As I obey the commands of my father. Why does Jesus obey? Do you like, all right, dad, I guess I'll do, I guess I'll go on earth and die on a cross. I guess I have to. I don't think it was like that. I think that Jesus exists with God in this love relationship where he understands what his father is about. And because he loves the father, he wants to do the father's will. He is about the father's business. They exist in unity together. So obeying God's commands is not about duty. It is not about what you must do. It is about intimacy. It's like this. It's the, the father and son are moving in sync with each other. What the father does, the son does. If the father loves someone, the son also loves in the same way. It's about unity. It is about communion together. They are unified in action. If the Father and the Son are one, how much sense would it make if the Father loves somebody and the Father's like, or sorry, the Son is like, God, you love that person? That makes no sense. I hate that person. That person's a jerk. It makes no sense, right? Because they are one. They are one in intention. They are one in desire. They are one in thought, action, and everything. So now comes the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is now the thing that, that God the Father and God the Son are sending to us. For what purpose? What does it say that the purpose is of this Holy Spirit? It says, okay, let's start from the beginning, verse 24. If anyone who, do, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. There you see that unity between Father and the Son. 
If you go back even further, um, sorry, to verse uh, 20, it says, On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. It's talking about the unity of love. We are unified together. And so by being unified with God means that we must understand what he wants and we want to do it. We are living in the rhythm and flow of what God does. God loves, so we love. God forgives, so we forgive. God is generous, so we are generous because we are unified with God. You see that, friends? And so then what place is the Holy Spirit? Going back to verse 25. All this I have spoken while still with you. So Jesus told us what the Father's will is. And how does that work out for us, friends? The the problem is that so many of us, we forget what Jesus has told us to do. We don't live by that. We live by a different way of being. But verse 26, it says, "But But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So what is the role of the Holy Spirit, friends? The Holy Spirit is there to remind you of what we are meant to do in God. All the ways that we are meant to obey God. We are meant to love others. We are meant to live in union with God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit is there to connect us fundamentally with God, right? So friends, if we want the Holy Spirit to do something that is contrary to the will of God, that is not in unity with the will of God, the Holy Spirit will not do it, right? Doesn't that just make sense? The Holy Spirit will only do what God wants it to do. The Holy Spirit is there to help you be fully unified with God so you are living in the freedom and flow of following his commands and living the way that he wants you to live. Friends, this is the ultimate unity. This is the ultimate uh, sort of, you know, um, way that we are meant to live. And, you know, Going back uh, to verse 19 and 20, um, you know, Jesus in this whole address is talking about how he's going to be going away. They're not going to see Jesus anymore, right? And so Jesus was their direct link with God. He's like, hey, if you see me, then you've seen the Father. You know the Father because you know me and you've lived with me, right? We talked about that last week. But now Jesus is going away. So now the Holy Spirit is going to be that direct link that we have with God, right? And so he says that, that I'm going to be going away. Verse 19, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you, right? And so he talks about revealing himself, the Holy Spirit, to uh, the disciples, right? to the people who want to live in unity with God. And, and so uh, th- there's this question that Judas has. And the Bible tells us, this isn't Judas Iscariot, uh, the, the one who uh, betrays um, Jesus. This is a different Judas. But verse 22, it says, Judas says, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? It's a good question. Why is it that some people cannot see the Holy Spirit or cannot feel or experience the Holy Spirit? Why is it that there are times where we don't seem to sense the Holy Spirit? Right? And Jesus tries to make this clear. Um, and so he replies, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. There it is again, right? Third time we see that in this passage. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. This is what the obeying God's teaching is all about. For God to live in you. For Jesus to be in you. By you saying, 
God, I want to be about your business. I want to live like you. I want to love the things you love. I want to love the people you love. I want to live for your will, not mine. And I want to live in that rhythm in unity by which you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit always live. You're always about each other's business. You're always unified in sort of the way that God is. God is about love. God is about seeing this whole world come to be connected with God. And and so, friends, why does the world not see the Holy Spirit or sense the Holy Spirit? Because the world is not about those things. You know, um, when we ask for the Holy Spirit, when we want to be unified with God, why is that? Do we want to be unified with God ultimately just to serve ourselves? just to serve our own selfish needs or desires. You know, like, God, I just want to be unified with you just for myself, just so I can have peace of mind and heart, just so I can be happy. Or, or worse, you know, that we say, God, you know, I, I want to have you in my life so that you can give me what I want, like, you know, to give me this kind of, like, happy material life. And so a lot of us, we wonder, well, why isn't God sort of, you know, Why isn't he answering that prayer? Why can't I sense the Holy Spirit? So Jesus, his answer is very simple. He says, if you love me, you would obey my commands. Friends, this is not to say that you must be perfect in obeying God's commands in order to sense the Holy Spirit. That's not what it's saying, right? But we must understand the end goal to this. Do you want to obey the commands of God? Do you want to live in unity with what God is doing? Not are you? Because the answer to that question is usually no. I'm not living in unity with God's commands. I'm not living the way that God wants me to. But is there a desire in your heart to say, I want to be unified with God. I want to be unified with Jesus. I want to be about what God is about. Do you want that? Do you desire that? Because in that way, the Holy Spirit helps you. So if that is your desire to be unified with God, then the Holy Spirit is going to help you to do the things that you cannot do on your own. So friends, I think that we sometimes misunderstand. We, like we said, I think we think that the Holy Spirit is only there for super spiritual people. You know, for people who have their act together, for people who are already living according to the will of God. I think it's different to say that you're already living according to the will of God versus you want to live according to the will of God, right? So let me give you an example, a very practical example. What if there's somebody that you've been trying to love, but that person is just difficult to love? Now, you know that you should be loving that person. You know, just objectively, just, you know, kind of when you take the emotions out of it, you're like, I don't feel like loving that person. I I, I don't look at that person like, oh man, I want to love that person because that's the problem. I look at that person and all I think about is how they annoy me. I look at that person and I think about how they've hurt me. And so, no, I don't feel like loving that person. That's the problem. If I felt like loving the person, then I would do it, right? Right? But is there a part of us that we see, you know what, for me to live according to the will of God, according to God's commands, would be for me to forgive this person? Do you have the desire? Because if you have the desire to live according to the way that God wants you to, then the Holy Spirit will help you. Does that make sense, friends? Right? So it doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means that you want what God wants for you. And so, going back to our example of the person that you have a hard time loving, you know, that might mean that you look at that person and you do feel, you know, very unholy thoughts. You do think the person is a big jerk. You are annoyed. You aren't able to love that person. But you bring that before God. And that is the time that you spend with God. That is one of the things you do. When you come before God, One of the most important questions that you can ask yourself in your time with God is, what is bothering me? Why is my soul disturbed? 
What is keeping me from being unified with the purposes of God? You know, the purposes of God to be loving, to be unified to God and unified to other people. And many of us, we know what those things are, you know? And so we may come before God and, you know, you've been dealing with a very frustrating person. And so instead of just putting that out of your mind, like, ah, I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on God. But what does it mean to be unified with God? It means that you must be focused on the things that God himself would do. What would Jesus be like with that person? That's difficult. Would Jesus be like, well, you're just a big jerk, so I'm going to write you off. You know, hey, you hurt me, I hurt you back. Is that what God is about? No. God would love and forgive that person. Now, you can't do it on your own. You're going to need the Holy Spirit's help. But when you come before God, that dissonance between the way that God wants you to be and the way that you actually are, this is what we do before God. You come before God and what is the whole goal of any prayer or any worship or any uh, a quiet time or devotional time with you and God? What is the whole purpose of that? That is for you to be united with God, for you to live in communion with God. And the thing that is preventing you from being unified to God, unified in purpose, unified in will, unified in action, is our selfish desires or our lack of forgiveness or our hurts, whatever that may be. And that hurt is legitimate, friends. When you come before God, you know, we say, God, I can't love this person. But Lord, can you help me do that? That's where you need the Holy Spirit. That's where you need the grace of God. And so friends, the Holy Spirit is able to help you to do what you absolutely cannot do. You may have heard me, if you've heard me preach before on some of these ideas of forgiveness, you may have heard me talk about how Christians throughout the ages have forgiven people in ways that are just absolutely supernatural. You hear about parents forgiving the killers of their kids through the power of the Holy Spirit. You hear about people forgiving, um, you know, in South Africa, there were Christians who forgave their apartheid oppressors who did horrible things to them, persecuted them, beat them, tortured them, arrested them. And in the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, they forgave them, right? This is something you cannot do on your own. You're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do these things by our own strength. Yes, the Holy Spirit is the power of God, but he's so much more than that. He's the advocate, the helper, that is teaching you to be unified to God. This is the real power that God wants to give to you to be able to be completely unified in will, in action, in desire and heart with the purposes of God. Friends, so the next time you go before God, you know, maybe this is something you can do, you can practice. You're, you're, you're sitting before God and you're trying to feel the peace of God, but you can't. There's something that's bothering you. There's something that is, is, is troubling you. Bring that before God. Don't pretend like that's not there. That's not the spiritual thing, friends. What God wants you to do is bring that before God and let the Holy Spirit help you to overcome it or to be able to, you know, be able to love more, to be more patient, uh, to be able to see the reasons why you're hurt, to heal those hurts that you're not able to heal on your own. The Holy Spirit wants to heal and bring into unity all the things within you that are in disunity between you and God and his purposes. So friends, yes, the Holy Spirit, it is about helping you to obey God's commands. But that's because to obey God's commands means to live in a true love relationship with Jesus, to have that true intimacy with Jesus in your heart and in your life. Friends, um, I, 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 you know, we're, we're going to close in a moment, but I, I just wanted to add that as your pastor, you know, these are things that I preach about. 
These are things that, that I believe. But I think that w- what I've been learning a lot in the past year or so is, is just that for me to just preach those things isn't enough. You know, and, and these are things that I'm kind of struggling through too. You know, I actually meant to say this from the beginning, but I'm no expert on the Holy Spirit. I, I still find it mysterious and I don't understand it all either. It's something that I want to explore more in this new year, new year resolution, if you will, you know, to, to kind of come to understand the Holy Spirit more. Because, yeah, there's some really kind of fantastical things, you know. But one of the things that, that I uh, am also understanding is those very simple ways where I'm very bitter against someone and I try to come before God and I, I just, I, I can't pray. I, I can't, you know, feel that unity with God. I can't feel that peace. Right? Or those ways where I, I, I lose my temper when I'm on the road, where I get that road rage, you know, where I get nervous or I get stressed out about something. Those are things that are the realm of the Holy Spirit. It's not just about speaking in tongues. It's not just about prophecy or these very fantastical things. The Holy Spirit longs to work within you, to help you to be the kind of loving, peaceful person that God wants you to be. You can't fake it before the Holy Spirit. He knows your heart. He knows who you are. And he wants to help you um, through the unity of your action and your intent and through prayer, through all of these things. He wants to help you to do the things that you cannot do on your own. He wants to help me to do the things that I can't do on my own. So friends, in this new year, um, I I want us to live closer to the will of God. I think that's what God wants for you as well. And we've been talking about, you know, New Year's and hope and all this change that comes about. Um, A a certain person, I I won't mention names, but I was talking last week about how, you know, the hope is not a, a thing that we have to change. And, you know, it's not about exercise or, you know, changing some external thing. And I think some people, they heard my message and they're like, yeah, I need to exercise more, you know. (laughs) You know, I I understand that it's so tempting to change the external things. But what God really wants to change in you is you, your heart, your character. That can only come by the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray in a moment after we uh, do communion, and and we're going to sing this song about the Holy Spirit, welcoming the Holy Spirit into your life. But friends, that's what this is about. That's what that song is about, to say, Holy Spirit, I want you to come live within me, to find if there's any offensive way in me, there's anything in my character that does not reflect you. Is there hubris and pride? Is there uh, abnormal self-love where I'm just Uh, you know, where it probably comes out of some insecurity, you know, that the Holy Spirit wants to smooth out, where where I can just be so loved by God that I'm not so self-conscious to hustle for my own self-worth by getting people to like me or getting people to see worth in me so I see worth in myself. Is there some way where I think that I need something else in my career, in my schooling, in the approval of other people for me to feel good about myself, where the Holy Spirit can remind me of the love that I have in God? Is there some way where I'm holding on to some hurt or wound that I got in a fight with someone or I'm bitter at someone and that bitterness has built up over time and I've just ignored it. I've just thought of it it as just something that's always there. It's just part of the scenery of my life, just like all the other things that exist. Oh yeah, there's that grudge with that person. There's that person that I hate. And I just ignore it. I've just let it go for so long. All that unforgiveness is built up like a deposit in my heart and it's just become hardened. Is there something that the Holy Spirit is seeking and saying, hey, you know what? We got to work on this in this new year. I want to come and clean house. I want to come and clean your character from the inside out. I want to come and help you to live in perfect unity with God, with his intent for you to love God, to love neighbor, 
to have nothing that separates you from either. This is what I want for you in 2016. Brothers and sisters, the question is, is, do you want that? Do you want to live in perfect harmony and unity with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit that binds it all together in perfect harmony and unity? That's what I want. Is it what you want?